Was Steinbeck, he was at Swarthmore just when your brother was at Swarthmore. He was? Yeah, he was. I didn't know that. Sorry, not at Swarthmore, I'm sorry. No, no. Stanford. Stanford, yes. Stanford. Sorry. And he was a graduate, but I thought he went to, he told me he went to New York from California mm -hmm. with seven dollars in his pocket. Hoping he'd make it, of course. Most of his manuscripts were rejected. Really? At first, and he really had a hard time in New York. Then when he did right. make a hit, right. everybody wanted to okay. publish him. How much of your time was spent translating and editing, and how much um, in teaching New York? in New York? No, I couldn't tell. I mean, uh, I never measured, but um, maybe half my time. Because I did... Uh, in order to make a little more money. I used to take out contracts for uh, translating big, uh, for example, I worked with the American Smelting Company, translating a big uh, contract between the company and the Peruvian government. Okay. It was very difficult because it's all legal terms and, and mining terms that I didn't know that much. Okay. Uh, it was at over a thousand pages. So that was a big job. Okay. And at that time, I was also teaching at NYU. But you would call yourself a... Uh, anything you want to call me, a second <laughs> To be correct. Anything, yes. Anything uh, I mean, associated with languages. Right. Either translating or writing. With Marti Ibanez, mm -hmm. the Spanish edition. Of, mm -hmm. and the, in Time Life, I did the first edition of Life in Spanish. I see. And the Grolier thing, mm. you may be curious. Yeah. I did uh, my first, what do you call my first books? Of, you know, like children's books, they got more difficult. There were 12 volumes. Oh, I see. From very simple to more and more involved, more involved. More involved. For children, it's called okay. my first knowledge or my first something. All right. I know in Spanish, primeros conocimientos, but I don't remember what the title was in English. Okay. okay. So, did you publish anything else? All, all of them were published. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. No, that's all. The Pearl was published, um, and the Gloria's books, and then the. Um, hired me and Gloria to do a translation of the uh, their encyclopedia. And I took on the job, but then after working on it for maybe two months, I realized that it was so American that you'd have to rewrite mm -hmm. it completely for Spanish or for Latin American audience. I mean, for example, when they would explain how the post office works yeah. in this country, but it doesn't work that way there. No. And it yeah, would have no meaning to it. Cool. He said, well, can't you translate? No, I say, I can translate it, yes, but it won't, it won't have any impact because mm. you're, it's so American in its approach. I mean, you're talking about how they do things here. Mm. This doesn't mean they do it mm. in Latin America or Spain. Mm. Are you happier doing the literary work or happier doing teaching? I, I like teaching, except that uh, uh, the thing I didn't, I, this is partly like John. I hated the faculty meetings and things like that. It drove me crazy. Mm. And then they were so poorly paid too. I mean, mm. uh, New York had New York University had mm. prestige and everything, mm. but their salaries were miserable. And I told the dean once, I said, I'm resigning, going to do something else. Oh, why? He said, I just put in for a substantial raise for you, three hundred dollars a year. I said, well, I'm sorry, but that doesn't, seem, doesn't take me out of the problem. No. So, so then I started freelancing yeah. and other things. And you know, when you're young, you, you take chances. You always can get, yeah. you always get out all right. Okay. And the word of mouth people say, oh, you know, he's available for this translation mm -hmm. of that. I never was without word. Mm -hmm. Sometimes pleasant, like I loved working with Steinbeck, but but uh, even Grolier was not not that bad. It was difficult with that to rewrite so much 
Robert Maxwell Spanish mm. people. Did you ever ask, when you did the with, work with Marty Ibanez, did you ever ask your brother about medical terms or...? Oh, yes. Yeah. Many times. And uh, he always... He always was so helpful. I said, no, don't give me more. I don't need all that information. Just, mm. what is this? And I have I said it correctly. Mm. Because he knew enough Spanish, John, to read what I said when mm. I was accurate. Mm. Did you ever read anything with Martí Ibáñez? He was an amazing yes. man because his English was as good as his Spanish. Mm. He didn't speak well mm. in English, but his writing, incredible. Is he interested in, in absorbing other cultures and, and then giving them to other people? In other words, writing about them in such a picturesque and lively way that you really were interested. I remember reading one of his uh, articles, one of his essays on Morocco. Mm. And it really made you feel like going to Morocco. I mean, the way he described the way they eat the meals, they, all that goes into a goose goose and all this business. Okay. And he had a great flair for it. And he liked good food. And he loved it, experimenting different cultures. So he was well traveled. Oh, yes. He yeah. All over the world. Okay. And was he married? or? Yes, twice. Oh. He, as the first wife, I think he married to be able to stay in this country. Mm -hmm. to, yeah. You know, and they didn't get along, so they divorced, then he married Josefina. I read her last name, she was a Puerto Rican. Okay. A very lovely woman, she had cancer. I see. And a, a beautiful uh, tropical garden in his office, <laughs> near the waterfall, all these ferns and things, dark oh, orchids yeah. growing. An enormous sculpture of Don Quixote in wood. You know, he mentioned him very often. Yeah. I don't know if nobody he knew him or not. He probably didn't because there are few people of any importance that he didn't oh, answer, yeah. which I did. But, uh, John never said I know. I invited you to the to dinner with his wife. Very yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, too, it's almost uh, too much. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't have considered it blowing a horn if he said I had them to dinner fine. Mm. Uh, and I would have said I've known them for many, many years. Mm. And that was funny. We knew the same people very seldom met them. I mean, came together. Oh, I see. He said to me, I'm having a big cocktail party on such and such a day, and I'd like to invite you, but there'll be people that I know you won't like. <laughs> and I said, How do you know? I just know it. I wonder who they were. I wonder too. I'd love to invite you, but I, I know there are people that you wouldn't like. Probably, I don't have no idea, maybe very loud or pushy or something, you know. Because John could collect a motley crew, everything from a, a, in a good intellectual to a little hustler of 42nd Street. Thought it was the same way too. Orton had a problem with Sarah Lawrence College where he was teaching, because he invited the president of the, of the college a little party at his home, and among the guests was a black woman that cleaned his apartment. And the president of Sarah Lawrence took a very dim view of that. Because she was obviously just a maid, black maid, but she was invited to the party. Which is perfectly all right. Absolutely. But uh, I forgot the president, if he, John told me, he said, you know, I was in trouble with Sarah Lawrence College because the president felt insulted that he would invite him on a black maid. And that's stupid. Yeah. Stupid. 
she might have been more intelligent than he. He probably had all the all the tricks of getting money for the college, yeah. but probably in intelligence she probably was superior. I had a black maid in New York for about 18 years from the deep south, really black, not, not mulatto. Or, yeah. And um, she, I, I kept her. She was the best worker, but she used to amuse me with her speech and what she, the way she, the way she uh, uh, described things. I remember her son married a very pretty, high, uh, white mulatto girl who had very attractive and apparently was stepping out on Anna, my maid mm -hmm. son. She said, I don't know what to do. I said, Anna, Anna was very religious. She sang in the choir of the Abyssinian church. I said, would well, you take her to a church with you? Maybe that would help her. She said, Miss Thompson, take her to church. No way. She said, ice holy and sanctified. Oh, boy. Ice holy and sanctified. She couldn't take her. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever she meant by that, I don't know. But if she saw this big black woman holy and sanctified, no, no, I would not go to the house holy and sanctified. I think your brother, I mean, did he know Martin Luther King? John? Yeah. Or did he, was he just in the sort of following? I know he Marsh, but I don't know whether yeah. he was in you. See, that's the problem with John, in my mind. He never really told me who he was, had contact with, or who he was seeing, or... Yeah. You see, it's interesting when you said, oh, you know, at the end of it, he said he couldn't say. Well, he could have, he could have perhaps known that there was some abuse going on. No, not in his, you know, that he might have known yeah. about something that was corrupt. That's right. And that was, which he felt he couldn't talk about, but was a psychological burden for him. I mean, That's that right. could... So, it's, you know, yeah, it's true. It could be... Yeah, because it, he did he did take things to heart and was upset by yeah. injustices or violence. Mm. Yeah. It really uh, yeah. made him very nervous, yeah. very, very yeah. And depressed many yeah. times. Like, I wish I could do something about yeah. it. Absolutely. So it could have been... That could have been a burden be. on him. That's right rather than something to do with you know, his feel, you know, his emotions. That's right. Included. It's you're right, a terrible weight. knowledge yeah, of, of something wrong. Something wrong, some experiment, Whatever, some yeah. mistreatment, some, you know, it could be something medical, something whatever. It could, you know, that there was something that he felt was so I know wrong. One thing that disturbed him was in the corporate world, how people knife each other to go up on the scale, the corporate scale, that just upset him a lot. And some, somebody he knew got knifed and yeah. demoted or somebody else took a higher job because they used politics or yeah. were knifing each other, yeah. jockeying for position. Yeah. And as you mentioned before, the, the fact that he took assistant professorship, I mean, he was far superior to probably most of the professors, but he was an assistant professor. Of course, he had a senior post at yeah. UNESCO, and um, although there they say as well, for his qualifications, the grade was too low. And then the assistant professorship at this new Jewish medical college is like, a, again, it's a sort yeah, of gesture yeah. of simplicity, isn't it? Yeah. And he probably didn't ask for, no, no. you know, could I be an associate or something, or no, no. you know, for a professor. Or, he was just a modest he was almost too modest in that sense. I mean, he, he wouldn't speak up for himself, or I demand more. If you want me, you have to give me something mm. better than yeah. this. He was always so thank you. Very, very grateful for it. Yeah. I think he, he liked Milton Roosevelt so much yeah. that whatever Roosevelt offered him, he would take I think he loved going there on Sundays. I think you go, yes, yes, he would have to go after Mass, I think he right. said. Yes. Be with the, oh, yeah. the children, Michael, and you know, the two girls as well.
but I, I didn't know. Um, they were in uh, Rye, was it, or were they? Where did they live? Um, in Larchmont. Larchmont. That's where I think he met um, uh, Yerushalmi, um, the, um, the Joseph Yerushalmi was there as well, sort of mm-hmm. sometimes in the summer. Yeah. It was a local rapper. And in the sheep, I think it was sort of a routine that said the sheep, I'd say it's not true. It wasn't the three, the three children adore him. I'm sure. Yeah. They were, he was very fond of the whole family. Mm. I remember when she opened a little Picasso mm. shop on Madison Avenue, he said, Do you know anybody with money who would be to see when Picasso said I don't know whether they were. I suppose there were reasons, I don't know if they were a prince, I don't know what she saw really. Probably originals. I visited Milton, there were these beautiful um, vases there. Yeah, you can do these wonderful, you did these wonderful ceramics. Yeah, yeah. Milton was in a small, it's a very sort of cosy place. In their home? Yes, he, it wasn't like Larchmont at all where he lived in, in um, Albuquerque. It was a very, very small, mm. tiny little place. And, um, but it was... <laughs> Because I have to be very careful, but I felt I've got to be careful to moving. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> no, just stop there with the sitting, <laughs> sitting there, yes. <laughs> Your brother didn't know Picasso? I don't think so. I don't think so. No. no. He knew Brack, but because he, he had a beautiful uh, lithograph of Black. And I think it has a, I'm not sure it has a description of it. But uh, and people, if he was a, a Black and Picasso were very close. I mean, they were both doing more or less the same type of work. Yeah, because Barry Bandler mentioned that your brother had sort of did, said, oh, you know, what you're doing is like Picasso. And so oh. said to, that's because to encourage Barry, isn't it? Oh, yeah. No, to me, what what I saw of the uh, Vandal's work was more impression, like the fresh impressions, like punctualism and things like that, where, where the brush strokes were more or less little dots rather than strokes. A mass of little... A mass, mass isn't very it? heavy, very heavy yes. paste. Yeah. said he worked very, always worked very quickly. Yes, yeah, so it looks like it's done, yeah. it's not very thought out or yeah. very, it's like it's a, mm. what you felt at the moment, yeah. that's it. And uh, it's very moody, there's a, you know, the, what I have here is a vase of flowers of his, yeah. which would be happy, but there's a, there's a gloom over it. Yeah. It disturbed me all that, I never had it where I would see it off, because it, was, it would depress me. I could sense that he was depressed the all. Very, very strong feelings. Yes, and it comes through in his work. And spoke to me in a very powerful way and very penetrating, beautifully formed sentences. Yes, yes. Fantastically observed. uh, In a real power of language. Yes. Terrific. Amazing. Um, But he's not painting anymore. No, he's there surrounded by canvases, but they're all from, they're all his past. Yeah. I would have to look at things like the Kierkegaard and <coughs> I think I'd have to follow the, you can say, the, the, your brother's intellectual breadth. Stunning. Incredible, really. Yeah. And always eager to learn more. I mean, he, he never was satisfied with what he already knew. He wanted more. In everything, he never found anything that really said, this is it now. Yes, beneath two house. Mm-hmm. Never. Never. Settled. When uh, 
he had this uh, tremendous uh, drive to listen to flamenco music. I thought maybe that because they do have a great, uh, as you know, uh, uh, lamentation in their songs, mm -hmm. minor key, and, and uh, it's a, most of them are laments, and there is uh, a person in pain, suffering. Uh, maybe this will, will help. I mean, maybe this will really be. Okay, so the, the enthusiasm burns through yeah, then. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And he thought, I always felt that he felt, that this may be what I really need to listen to. This will do, will fill that void. And I never did. He bought every Flamingo record ever printed, I think. And uh, some of them I told him that that is, that is, uh, nightclub flamenco is not, not the real thing. It's what tourists want to hear when they go to Spain or something. It's for nightclubs or, or, or stage shows, but real flamencos, when you find them in some little tavern near Sevilla, not on the stage or the special lighting or anything, when they're really singing their heart out. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if he took a trip to Spain just to hear that. Would have been in the 60s? Yes, in the Before late 50s, early 60s. 60s. But he did go to, when he, he didn't go forward that to France, but he did discover this anthology of flamencos done by Pate, the French company. Beautiful job. He had it. And they had recorded all the, the outstanding flamenco singers mm -hmm. of the period, men and women. And she was very much moved, the, the, the Saetas. Are you familiar with flamenco music at all? I've uh, sort of heard about it, and there was um, a book uh, 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 which was written about mm -hmm. someone who spent a long time and yeah. sort of goes to, as you say, to the, to so they the, have in Holy Week, yeah. in Easter, they have a week in the processions in Sevilla. And the Saetas is a flamenco type of song that sings the Passion of Christ as they walk down the street. Okay. The only accompaniment are drums and the voice of a flamenco singer the most moving thing you would ever hear. And of course, lamenting the crucifixion of Christ. And it's the sorrow, the pain in it, you wouldn't believe it. And uh, whether you're a Christian or not, just to hear that, well, the Jewish have a lot of lament in their, in their uh, religious songs. Yeah. The uh, block and those people, yeah. I mean, it tears your heart. And the flamenco was the same thing. John was very moved by the Saezas. They started around us. You could hear them walking down the street and lament, crying this lament for Jesus. That makes sense. Saezas in Spanish is, is an arrow. Okay. And the name of the, the type of Saez is called an arrow. Okay. So this, the enthusiasm for Fluenka was definitely when he was in New York rather than at in at Oviva in, in France. No, in, in New York. Definitely. I'm not quite sure. I mean, how often then he went back to Europe? Um, not too much. He went to Mexico a couple of times once to talk to Fran. I must remember they had an operation, a long operation. But um, to Europe now. Yeah. When he was with UNESCO, he did quite a bit. Of course. Yeah. Back and forth. That's when yeah. he used to stay with me. When he came to New York, he used to stay with me in my apartment, yeah. which he called Shangri La. <laughs> I think in one of the letters that he wrote me, I said to him, he mentioned Shakira. And when he visited Washington, did you see him when he visited Washington during the war? I saw him? Yeah, during no. the war. No, you were. No, no. no. never once. 
Because there were a couple of visits that he did during oh, the yes. war. Oh, yes. I was in the Navy yeah, at the time. I don't know where it was. I mean, where it was stationed. Yeah. The Pinnacle Bodhisattva. And as I told you, actually, it's only in the later years that we became good friends and related yeah. to each other. And I understood him more. To me, he was more, he's always been a mystery, but he was unfathomable at one time. I just, I just, I wash my hands and I can't, I can't go on, I can't figure it out. I think he was more, I mean, this, <laughs> when he called you from Wisconsin, in the thing, yes, he was so the, unsettled then. That's, and that was the beginning, actually, of our, yeah. of our knowing each other more. Then the war came and we went our ways to see each other. And then when he came to New York, we became very good friends. And uh, I know, as I told you, he enjoyed coming for his old fashioned drink and whatever I've been cooking or somebody been cooking. And he had a very good tooth. He liked to eat well. <laughs> So she said, he told me he did enjoy coming to my apartment after work because he could just relax completely. Didn't have to make any effort of any conversation or he didn't feel like talking. He just said, then I was breaking the wall. And I didn't try. I didn't really yeah. have to, no point yeah. in trying to make him he's not in the mood to talk to like me. Yeah. I see that. You know, the Russians, they don't, they have no article, they don't have the or an. They don't yeah. exist in Russia. And Jenya, my friend, she always tell me, I said, you want to listen? I'm not in mood, not in the mood, but I'm not in mood to do this. Okay. Sometimes I just have to say, you're not in mood to talk, no. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then I used to, love to come to my apartment uh, on opera nights because he didn't really want to go home all the way to change long distance to Riverdale. So I go to the opera. Mm -hmm. There's one detail I wanted to ask you and um, could you tell me the year that your grandfather died? Your mother's father. What year? Yeah, do you remember? I think it was 1917. Oh, he died already in 17. Yeah, I think so, 16 or 17. So it was in just at this, in the revolution, he yes. died? Yes, yes. Well, the revolution started in 1910. Okay. And the first constitution, when the thing is of the shooting and fighting and stuff, they made the first constitution in 17. And I think that's the year my grandfather died. Okay. So that meant the inheritance passed to the daughters and the son. With no inheritance, there was nothing. But it, they were already expropriated. You know, all expropriated. And his wealth, as my brother Philip said, he was extremely wealthy, but in the land and in, mm. in the uh, wheat and whatever he sold, and um, in actual money, liquid with cash now. As a matter of fact, he gave my father a very hard time when he wanted to marry my, my mother. But my father paid for all his expenses in the hospital, my grandfather. And burial and all that, he didn't have money to pay himself. So, it's a sort of t ironic turn that the person that my grandfather had looked down on was the one that paid all his expenses in the hospital. He was in the French hospital in Mexico and paid for the funeral. All, all expenses connected with the, the final stages of life. He was such a grand, sort of grandee. And, yeah, he yeah. was, and it was a white goatee and all that. Was, but penniless. Okay. Sorry. And that meant your brother Philip really was a self-made man. Oh, in, absolutely. In of Philip and Val and so on, but it was just their yeah. um, no, good instinct. Philip always uh, 
and he loved the Mira Flores. He was always hoping that we would do something. Yeah. The land we couldn't touch had been already expropriated. But the houses, there were three, ho three houses, different parts of the hacienda. He always dreamed of refurbishing them, and of course it never happened. But in John always spoke of, he said, we're just like Chekhov and the cherry orchard. Always dreamed of going back. And he dreamed of John, and he said, no, I said, but you don't even remember. He said, I do, I do. I remember it perfectly. Because he was so young when he left. And he, he said we could, uh, we could get a Mira Floritos, a little Mira Flores in Portugal. Let's, let's uh, pool our resources. And I was smart enough to realize that it would be my resources. He, he'd come up maybe with $10 or $20. And to him, anything was, $20 was very important, but in 2000, it was not more important than $20. I mean, yes. he felt if he contributed 20 well, that's okay. Did he say that in the 50s, when you visited him in yes, Ovid? When, yeah, when he, yes. Yeah, that's when he had the idea of going to Fatima and... Um, yeah, that's right. Um, and he wanted to go to the Algarve and have it buy a little place, call it Little Mita Flores. She was fascinated by this Fatima um, She was, yes. But anything... Strange, strange. Uh, when I went to Ireland, he said, well, I'll come to visit you. Because, uh, no, but when I was talking about going to Ireland, he said, if you do go, I'd come visit you for Our Lady of Knock is there. So he was fascinated by shrines and by apparitions. The Virgin of Guadalupe he loved. Yeah. She appeared on the, on the sack of the Indian, you know, who was carrying roses. And when he emptied his sack of flowers, the Virgin appeared on the sack. He loved that. He was so interested in hallucinations, you see. He was yeah, very, yeah. It's a mixture of sophistication and, hallucinations. and, and the sort of naive, deep faith. Yeah, and also naivete. I mean, he would accept the fact that she appeared painted on this horse uh, gunny sack where, where Diego was carrying the flowers. And when he went, I went with him a couple of times to the Basilica of Guadalupe, Mexico. And he would kneel in front of her altar with the original, supposedly the original, where she appeared on the sack. And she would actually translate it. This was when? In the 60s, in the 50s, in or the, before that? In no, the 30s? No, no, when, actually, when my mother was operating, I think it was in the 40s. Wait a minute, mean, no. Yeah. Later, because he was already in New York. Oh, I see. Sometime when he was in New York. He was because we both flew to Mexico. But your brother had been to Ireland, in any case? Oh, my father? No, your brother. Oh, yes. I, 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 didn't he do some work in Ireland, an internship or something? After he graduated from when he got his medical degree. I have a feeling that he did something, that he worked in medicine for a brief period in Ireland, I, and I understood it was his, like, internship. It could be. I might. It's possible. Because you have to do a clinical... Well, a clinical it, I'm yeah. almost sure that he told me that he did that. Well, that's interesting. And he could imitate the Irish brogue perfectly. The brogue. Yeah. And he was helping Tim with his algebra and all that. And Tim would get upset and nervous. And say, Tim, you're being Irish. Okay. You could be more Irish than Timothy O'Callaghan. Oh, I see. Tim Tim had an Irish oh, ancestry. Oh, completely, yes. Yeah. Oh, right. Father and mother were from, uh, from County Kerry, actually. From a place.
place called Kumin, a little tiny village, and Nagasho. He was born in, in Brooklyn, but uh, his parents both came over. So that was like a, a homecoming when they back to return to Oh, yeah. The Yank relative coming to back to the little side. Well, it's it the is. common pattern. Yeah, yeah. It's common. There's a town not far from where I lived in Ireland. I forgot what they called it, but they, mm. they, to this day, when I left Ireland, mm. they wouldn't allow electricity. People, they, they, the residents wouldn't allow them to put any electricity. They tell no lights, no refrigerators, no television, nothing. And they fought it tooth and nail. And when I left, they still hadn't been able to electrify the town. Okay. Okay. Which is so nice. Mm. They put all their things on the balcony on the outside the window to keep cool. No refrigerators, no television. You won't find that anymore in Holland. Oh, no. I think it's <laughs> it's ultra yeah. ultra modern. So when I left in 1980, yeah. I think it was years after that. So Absolutely. Started going wild. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know the one indication was a German was building a paper factory right outside the town of Kidmere to make paper. Well, there's been absolutely massive investment in Cork. Although when I was there, Ford had a, uh, an assembly plant in Cork, and they had to close because they couldn't rely on their workmen. They were always either drunk or wouldn't show up for work, and they always had excuses: a wedding. A, uh, baptism, a death in the family, they wouldn't show up for work. And they went into high tech. I mean, it's real high tech, oh, yes. computer based, and so on. So no, it's an absolute and, modernization. And the Irish were still Middle Ages in many ways. Yeah. Uh, it was too much of a jump from one thing to another. I mean, it was still trotting on donkey carts and things like that, yeah, you know. Yeah. And you had the, the Concord flag over it. Hard and you would hear the thunder of the engine and hear with the Irish with a little donkey. Yeah. Okay. That's right, I and mean, I remember seeing peat cutting mm. the donkeys and they're taking the peat that they were cutting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And John liked Irish, so I met when, of course, he was. Was a very Catholic country, and he always spoke high. And he never mentioned the Catholicism, but I could sense it. Mm. That attracted him. That the, he'd see a peasant a farmer's family walking miles to church on Sunday to mass. Mm. All the kids well dressed, and, and walking actually miles to get to the church. Like the Latin American countries, not a lot of it was. Uh, I imagine they they felt something, but a lot of it was superstition too. They were very afraid of the church. You know, just like they were afraid of the of the fairies. They cast an evil eye on you. You've had it. So you better be good to the Virgin and to all the saints because they, they might do something that you were not expecting. Six. I find it it's extraordinary the way your brother, I mean, he's in some ways so sophisticated in terms of the, I say, his, yeah. you know, his aesthetic sense and, and then there's this other side with very, very simple religious images. Yes, like, like a child almost. Yeah. But um, that's John, you know, everything was either very yeah. sophisticated or very naive, childlike. And having sort of really child, not childish in a stupid way. But but the, the trust, the, the faith of a child, yeah. that you tell this is this, they accept it. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it, it's right, because in the, it was a, it was a mystical, his, his, his religious sensibility, yeah. that it was, a, it, that he loved this Pater Philippe, and 
there it was a sort of miss it was absolutely the sort of an interest in the mystic tradition that's right rather than in the sort of rational oh, intellectual no, or no no exactly it was, um, just like you're, you're a mystic can tell you how they reach god i mean yeah. it's an experience that the trance they're in, whatever it is, that, yeah. that they have this union with with God and the stages that they have to purify their soul mm. to get there. Okay. Santa Teresa's book, The Seven Dwelling Places, that's, that's what she called her book. That's uh, 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 Teresa of Avila. Avila. Right. Yeah. And I love that book because yeah. she's so, as I said, so direct so uh, simple in her approach to the seven stages that the soul goes through before it before it finds you. I don't think I ever got time to read it, but he did read Sanskrit. He did. He writes a letter that he's, oh. he's reading. The only question I had was because there are a, there are a couple of St. Teresa's. Which one? I was just wondering whether no, it was Avila. But I didn't know whether because she has one that's more or less a biography, as autobiography. Yeah. So. And the one that I liked a lot was the Seven Dwelling Places. I don't know whether you read that one. Probably did because most of the things, anything connected with the saints' writing, he would he not want to know was like them, but he thought read them. St. John of the Cross, he was devoted to. And I've never read St. John of the Cross in English. I don't think he read him in Spanish. Because it was an effort for him to... I mean, he wasn't... He didn't feel comfortable in Spanish. Okay. I think, I imagine he read it in translation. Actually, I, when I had to dismantle his apartment and I didn't have time to look at the books. I just saw all these books that had to be boxed and sent somewhere because the people that owned the apartment building were pressing me to get out. And then not only get out, but I had to pay the all that somebody took the apartment. And the super was showing some other apartment when I advertised it today. such a beautiful collection of books. Hmm? It's such a beautiful collection know, of books and I, and I that found that each one absolutely fascinating yeah. and because sometimes your brother has got a pencil with yes. notes in the margin and um, I mean those that I've I spent two days looking at, them. looking at them and studying them and it was never enough time. And I always felt no there are sections of this library and I don't understand it yet. Yes. The religious, you see, now I would understand much more the religious books. And that's how yes, and the, the more we've talked about it, the more I understand, John, from mm. your observations, too. I mean, it's the only way anybody could ever know him is talking about him and trying to put this puzzle together. Mm. I mean, somebody's really interested in, in analyzing his psyche mm. and his, his emotional states. Is it? But he mm. prays most of my life. Mm. And he, I think he would have made a, an exceptional father of his own if he had children. Mm. I think that probably was one thing he missed. Mm. Because all these other people he, that he took under his wing, he, they were his children. Yeah. Absolutely. He he moves from being the the disturbed adolescent to that's being right. the, the, father, the father, the confident father right. figure, having that and, state and of authority. Security. Yeah. Making them feel secure yeah. and not frightened. Mm. It even speaks about, gives advice about child rearing, how you bring up children to mothers. Even if he, at first he thought he should, the fact that he was being ordered would make him say no. Okay. You tell me, can you imagine what they wanted me to do with the servant? I'm not going to do that. This was at Einstein. 
call. Uh, he said, yes, it's the uh, university there. Yeah. Okay. Although I am sure that, and I know that Rosenbaum was most uh, accommodating to John. So I think he put up with John's tantrums or something and took some thought that were worth it, John. 